and welcome to another episode of Fully Charged. Now, we've covered a lot of things on Fully Charged over the years, you know, solar panels, batteries in houses, wind turbines, uh, energy storage, grid level energy storage, electric cars. Those are all really important new technologies, but the one elephant in the room, I always think, is heat. Now, we know that we can produce electricity without burning anything, but how do we produce heat? without burning anything. I mean, I can't do it in my house. I still burn some fossil fuels to heat my house in the winter. And this is really a big problem. And when we were in Scotland last year, we went to see a company called Star Renewable Energy, who have come up with a really amazing and very big solution to how we heat our houses using renewable energy. So Dave, for a start, thanks very much for letting us sit, come in your factory. No I love going in factories and there's some brilliant things I can tell being constructed here. But from what I understand, and it's very basic, you've been building refrigeration equipment for, yes. for a long time, but now you've started diverging into to heat pumps. Yes. And is that, I mean, this is a real layman's question, I'm assuming there is a connection between the two technologies. Totally, and, and the refrigeration system makes one end cold and one end warm. And you'll be trying to make environmentally friendly refrigeration systems with natural working fluids. And we realised we were throwing away all this heat, a bit like the fridge in your house, it just right. chucks it away. And we thought, well, you know, if we can harness that to do heating, maybe we can stop burning as much gas. So yeah. that, that's kind of where the, the concept uh, struck home for us. It's not, not a new invention. No. It was 1852, it was first talked about by Lord Kelvin right. in Glasgow. Wow, so, so you're in the home of, yeah, of the idea. Um, I really, I didn't realise it was that old, because a lot of those things like fuel cells and batteries, you know, and light bulbs, very, very old, in fact, old, and electric motors. Old yep. technology. I didn't realise heat pumps was... So they, they had worked out that you could extract the heat from, say, river water or the air. Yeah, and, and there, there's been some good examples over the years, quite a few in Switzerland during the Second World War. They, they struggled to get access to oil and gas, right. um, but lots of hydro, so they were building heat pumps to make you know, three or four units of heat for one unit of electricity, and that, that's the, the simplicity of it. You put some electricity in that moves the, the compressor, and that moves the heat from the, the colder place to the warmer place. Right. If you measure it in pure kilowatt hours, is a heat pump more efficient than, than burning gas? And, and oh, I mean, a good gas boiler will probably be about 85, 90% efficient. Right. A good heat pump could be 400% efficient. Oh, <laughs> right, okay, so yes. <laughs> but it's amazing. I, I mean, even better, if, you know, if we were in a city centre, for example, and putting a, a river source heat pump, we could put a unit of electricity in and get four units of heat, but we then get four units of cooling that we could be sending to data centres or, you know, office cooling. So oh, actually, right. you can do you can both at the same time. Right. So then we're getting seven units of useful energy movement yeah. for, for one unit of electricity, wow. which wow. obviously brings an economic argument to it as well as right. the, the carbon argument. Because I mean, so far I've only seen domestic scale heat pumps, you know, either air source heat pumps or ground heat pumps and people I know have got, you know, the pipes underneath their garden and that, you know, that's extracting it. But you, I mean, you're working on much bigger machines. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the largest project was in a town called Drammen in Norway. Um, it's 13,000 kilowatts of capacity. So that's the wow. equivalent of 13,000 one bar electric heaters worth of heat, but only 67% of that is coming from the from the fjord and one third is coming from electricity. So right. you're getting three units of heat for one unit of electricity, even at 90 degrees heat delivery. So right. I think the big difference as well from small to big is also relatively low temperature for small heat pumps at 45 degrees, but 90 degrees for big heat pumps. So you can go back to an old building that's got an old heating system, old pipes, old radiators, and swap it out, swap out the boiler for a heat pump, and get the benefits. Wow! But when, because when you say Norway, you know I've been there. It's bloody cold, even in the summer. So you're extracting heat from from seawater, is that right? Yes. But you just think Norway, you know, you wouldn't. I wouldn't want to go swimming in the, uh, on a Norwegian beach. It gets pretty chilly, yeah. but you know, so long as we can cool it down a bit more, then we're taking heat out of it. So right. we're cooling the seawater from eight degrees to four degrees and taking about 10 megawatts of heat out in doing that. So we're, wow. we're effectively doing 10 megawatts of cooling 
or taking heat away yeah. from the same, same thing. And then adding the electricity and we get about 14 megawatts of, of heat at the other end. Right. And then that heat, presumably in a Norwegian town, they're really good at that. That's, that's heat that heats all the houses in the town. Is that what it's doing? So they've, they've got about 28 kilometres of pipe buried under the street. They've right. even got a bridge that's got district heating across it, but they don't put insulation on it, so it stops the ice and snow forming in the bridge. The so bridge. Wow. we've got a district heating heat pump heated bridge <laughs> in Norway. Bridge. You know, God. it's amazing what you can achieve if you try. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, at some point, it must have been they would have had gas heating or I don't know what they, they would have they, used they, originally. They did, and they did, and they do still have gas heating. Right. It, it costs them five times as much to run the gas boilers as the heat pumps. Right. And um, so they're doing about 67 million units of heat from the heat pump every year, which is 85 percent of what the energy station sends to right. the town. So that's what, about eight, 82 uh, gigawatt hours yeah. in a year, it's quite a lot. I mean, I'm just thinking of the energy you're putting into it, but all you're doing is you're, there's electricity going into it to run the pumps. Is that, is that essentially the only electricity you're using? Yes, that's all it it's does. just electricity to run the pumps and right. compressors. Right, and their electricity is pretty much 100% renewable anyway, because of... Yeah, the, the, so that, and that's the, the carbon piece in Norway, they're probably pretty close to 100% saving on the carbon. In the UK, our grid is, is decarbonizing all the time because yeah. of renewables and uh, moving from coal to gas. So we're probably saving in the UK about 50% of the carbon right. if we use grid electricity for, for a, a heat pump. For so, a heat pump. I mean, is it technically feasible, I mean, forget the economics for a moment, but technically feasible for all the heating in this country to be done with heat pumps? I mean, that's, is there any reason we couldn't do that? Pretty much every town is close to a river or the coast, yeah. and if, if not a sewage treatment plant, which has got water right. flowing out it. So the River Clyde in Glasgow, there's eight times as much heat as the city centre in Glasgow needs. Is it easier to extract heat from water than, say, from the air, like air source heat pumps? Which uh, absolutely. Right. I mean, it's a, a density thing. So, you know, water is much more condensed than, than, than air is. So right. there's, more, there's more mass in a, in a volume. Right. So much easier to get heat from from something that's uh, solid right. and equally much easier to get heat from something that's liquid compared to solid ground, for example. Right. So plastic pipes in the ground is quite tricky because you're relying on the heat to move through the ground into the plastic pipes. We just pump the water out the river, cool it down by a couple of degrees and put it back put it into back the in. river right. and it, it disappears downstream. And you know, it's not going to stop raining in no. Glasgow or, no. or, or, <laughs> or anywhere in the UK. So, <laughs> so I'm just, just getting my head around it. It's not, you're not running pipes that, that flow a liquid on, the, on the, like the bed of the river. You're actually taking the water from the river, extracting Absolutely. it from it, and putting it back we've, in. We've, we've been pumping water from rivers for yeah. thousands of years. The difference here is we're putting it back. We're, yeah. not, we're not keeping it, so we're not going to drain the rivers. We're just right. cooling them down by you know, a maximum of three degrees, which in fact, the rivers are tending to heat up because of civilization. So right. we're actually helping to, to keep the environment you know, where it's it meant to be. be. Right. If coastal cities then could do the same with seawater. I mean, does Ab it, absolutely. salt water doesn't matter. You as long use... as the materials of the heat exchanger are correct, then right. you can do that. And that's, right. you know, the, the, the fee order in Norway is salt water. Well, that is salt water, right. right. Now, are there sort of technologies that are emerging now that can, can improve that? I mean, I presume it's a const constantly improving technology, but is there... I think I think the big one for us is uh, the wind turbines. And right. actually at the moment, the grid gets a little bit full when it's very windy because yeah. there's too much electricity in the grid. So we're actually paying people not to run wind farms, which is crazy. Yeah. But when it's windy is when the houses are draftiest, which is when you need the most heat. Right. So actually we could be drawing that electricity that at the moment we're just uh, not generating. We could be using that in heat pumps. Right. So there's a natural connection between wind farms and, and, and heat pumps as well. Yeah. You know, they're very symbiotic. And I mean, is there a way, I mean, are, are people working on ways of st storing heat? I mean, I suppose you can, in an in like an insulated water tank is a way of storing heat. It, but I mean, on a kind of industrial scale, is that it's really the, a bit... It's the cheapest way to store energy is in hot water. Right. And the cheapest way to do it is in large tanks rather than small tanks. But even the district heating pipes, for example, uh, in the town in Norway, they, they turn up the temperature in them slightly and store heat in them and then switch the heat pump off and get the heat back out from the pipes later in the day. So. The other thing in the UK we're seeing is that electricity is you know, up and down like a yo-yo yeah. in terms of availability. We could run the heat pumps when we want to, when electricity is cheapest. Right. And actually at certain times of day, electricity is on, a, on a wholesale price yeah. is, is you know, very cheap. We're always yeah. giving it away. So um, you, you, make, you make the heat when it's cheapest, store it for a few hours, and then release it into the, into the buildings. But even the, even the buildings are a thermal store of yeah. sorts. You know, why have the, the temperature 
uh, the heat pump or uh, boiler switched off overnight and then switch it on at seven o'clock. Why not just have it slightly on from right. five in the morning when electricity is cheap and yeah. you know, not creating this huge spike in demand yeah. that's, that's so challenging. A slightly overused term of smart cities. Yeah. Um, smart cities for us in terms of heat pumps means running the heat pumps at the right time, but also the right temperature. So we don't have to be running pipes at 80 degrees when it's a, a typical you know, spring or, or yeah. autumn day in the UK. And you know, frankly, the UK's climate's a bit boring. We've got three weeks of winter, yeah. three weeks of summer, and 46 weeks of sprotum. So <laughs> uh, sprotum is perfect weather for it heat pumps. Very, yeah, there's a lot of sprotum. Is, I mean, is a bigger system more, more efficient? I mean, Absolutely, right. yeah. 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 It's, uh, also, you, you, you get a certain diversity, so you don't have to have such a big heat pump as you would say for a thousand buildings. Right. There wouldn't be a thousand times the size of one building's heat pump. Right, because they're not all wanting heat at the same no, time. No, so no. that diversity is extremely good. It's almost right. like carpooling of the heating world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David. You're very welcome. Really good, good to talk to you. I'm great to see what you're up to here. Thank Fantastic. you. Thank everyone at Star Renewable Energies for letting us have a look around their factory. It was an amazing visit. It was very brief, uh, but it was really good to see. Uh, really exciting technology and really good luck to them. We're going to be covering a lot of other aspects of technology in a similar vein in the coming years on Fully Charged. Uh, but before I go, I just want to say a big thank you to a handful of our really special Patreon supporters who uh, donate $10 a month or more. And they are... Picks up sheet of paper to read names. Michael Obrist, Michael Cohen, Will Turner, Humphrey Bradley, Steve Potter, Erich Sikra, Ian Howard, and Deepak Kosler. Thank you very much for your support. This show is entirely dependent on Patreon support, and it's what's made it possible to do what we've done. Uh, so please do have a look at the little Patreon link underneath. If you haven't subscribed to Fully Charged, please do. Uh, it's amazing that we've got so many subscribers. We always need more. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. And as always, if you have been, thank you for watching.